Uh, yep, so hi, I'm Tom, uh, software engineer at Privata. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the risk of unintended information disclosure um, in data publishing. Uh, you might be able to tell that I went to our research team for help with the name of this uh, talk. Um, so at Privata, our mission is to promote and facilitate uh, the ethical and safe use of data. And we do this because we believe that data can be used for good. So it could be used for improving transport links, uh, curing diseases, um, choosing your next uh, favorite film, um, or um, aiding education. And it would be detrimental to society uh, if data was unable to be utilized due to fear of releasing informa uh, sensitive information about individuals. But we must consider that when we're publishing data, we are increasing this risk of inf uh, releasing information about individuals. And these risks can uh, lead to real harm. So for individuals, you might find out information such as personal information such as um, religious beliefs, political affiliation, um, sexual orientation, um, um, and, this can, and can, this can cause real harm. And for publishers, people uh, may not trust, trust you anymore. You might lose some of your reputation. Um, and this means that people might not want to contribute to your data sets in the future. Uh, and there's also a, risk of, a real risk of uh, quite significant fines. And as we look to industry as a whole, um, people may not longer, no longer want to share their data. They may not trust people to be able to look after it. Um, and they may start to give uh, un, un, incorrect answers to uh, questions. And so data privacy is uh, basically trying to reduce this risk um, to a level at which it no longer uh, inhibits the releasing of data. And when I say dating, releasing data, I don't mean just pu making it public to everyone. Uh, this is kind of like, inter like intercompany um, and an internal sharing as well. Um, and so there's no magic solution to all of data privacy's problems. Uh, each data type poses its own separate risks. Uh, and so today we're going to look at different uh, vulnerabilities in each of these data types uh, and look at some ways that we can defend against them. So the first thing we're going to look at is low dimensional data. Uh, so this is things like patient records, um, school uh, records, or customer profiles. Uh, and so I'm going to introduce to you Bob, Alice, and Charlie. Uh, and they've recently been for a, uh, a, health, a health screening. And their results have been recorded in this table here. So along with their test results, we also have the national ID, zip code, date of birth, and gender. And we're going to start by breaking down this table and seeing what each of these columns are contributing uh, to the problem. So the first thing we have is the sensitive column. Um, and this is what the individual wants to keep private. Uh, it is not known to the public, but it might be of interest to some adversaries. You might notice this also we have name and national ID, and these are direct identifiers. So these are things that can identify people with 100% certainty. Um, it doesn't require much imagination to see how we would attack a data set like this, but if we drop the name and we still have the national identification, I can introduce the first attack. So this is a, a direct re-identification attack, and here we have an adversary that's managed to get hold of some public information. So information such as this can be purchased between five to ten dollars um, for things like credentials to your social network accounts um, and, and personal information such as uh, where you live and stuff like that. And then once they've got this information, it's just a case of linking together the national ID column, and you can go from the name to the test result. Uh, it's not a very sophisticated attack, and there's quite a few things we can do to protect against this. The most efficient um, and simple form of um, protecting against information leakage uh, is the concept of data minimization. Uh, basically, we don't know what's going to change in the future. So we don't know what uh, methods of inference people will have, what might be cons considered sensitive, uh, or what data might become public in the future. So we want to follow these simple steps to try and uh, try protect against this. So you should only collect the data you need, delete the data once it's served its purpose, and mask the data that doesn't need to be in plain view. And this concept of masking, uh, there's two ways that we'd normally do this. The first is tokenization. So with tokenization, you're randomly selecting tokens um, from a configured range of possibilities. Uh, we're taking a, and we're then creating a value to token map. Um, this is good because you can preserve formats. So if you've got things like email addresses, uh, postcodes, or telephone numbers in your data set, you can still preserve their format. Uh, and it's impossible for a, an adversary to look at the values of the tokens and um, infer what their original values were. Um, if you want to go from these converted values and back to the original ones, you'll have to go through the software that you used to tokenize it in the first place, and that will require to be connected to the database that holds all these things. So an alternative approach is to encrypt this data. Um, encryption is taking the raw value, uh, encrypting it, and using that as the token. And uh, the issue here is that you can't really preserve format. 
Uh, there are some method methodologies there for format preserving encryption, but due to in uh, increased computational time uh, and also uh, decreased security, we probably recommend not doing that. There's a third way of tokenizing, uh, which is hashing, but we wouldn't normally recommend this. Uh, and so with, there's a couple of reasons why people think hashing might be a suitable way of tokenizing uh, values. Um, and that's because tokenizing does indeed go from a raw value to a gibberish token uh, or a hash. Um, and with that hash, it's impossible to then go back to the original raw value. Um, also, it's something that as data scientists and computer engineers, we're quite familiar with. We're hashing all the time. We're kind of used to it. And thirdly, uh, hashing has some applications in, security, in the security context before, so we use it for hashing passwords. However, there's an attack on this that's quite simple, uh, and it's due to the limited space of identifying um, values. So it's possible if you create a list of all possibilities of the, um, the identifying ID, you can then calculate the hash for those. Um, and once you've calculated the hash, you can then join the two tables up together, um, and you've got from the name to the, the test result. There are some limiting factors in the success of this attack. Uh, the first is working out what the correct hash was. Um, but in reality, there's a really limited number of good hashes. Uh, and the second is the, the space of the ID that you're trying to calculate. But unless this, the ID is in the range of mi uh, billions, um, you can kind of compute this time, uh, compute, this, compute these values in a quite a sensible time. Uh, so this actually happened. Um, some information was released on New York City taxis. Uh, and it was the journeys that they made. And with this data, they published the hash version of the medallions. Uh, and a researcher realized uh, that these values had been hashed and recognized them as MD5 hashes. Uh, and with two hours, he'd been able to create every uh, possible combination of uh, medallion, uh, compute its hash, uh, and then reverse, reverse it back to get the uh, correct medallion values. He didn't go as far as doing this, but it would have been very possible uh, with information that's out there to go from medallion value to the registered driver. Uh, work out where they've been, where they live, um, and probably infer their, uh, their income based off the amount of journeys they've made. So when we mask or remove um, direct identifiers, we're, create, we're creating data that is referred to as pseudonymous, um, and that is where people can't be trivially looked up in that data set. Uh, but there's other information in a data set that can be Id identifying. So for example, the zip code, date of birth, and gender, when you combine them together, it forms a unique identifier. Uh, and there's a fact that uh, the US population, um, you can identify 78, uh, 87 percent yeah, of them based off the combination of their zip code, date of birth, and gender alone. Um, and we call these quasi-identifiers. So now if we drop the direct identifiers, uh, we can move on to the next attack, which is the linkage attack. Uh, so again, our adversary now has been able to get hold of uh, some public information. So now that he's got Bob, Alice, and Charlie, and Eve's zip code, date of birth, and gender, uh, and he's able to then merge these two tables and go from the name to the test result. Um, another example of when this happened uh, in, uh, in real life uh, was in Massachusetts. They released uh, some ho hospital data um, about hospital visits. And the uh, governor at the time, William Weld, uh, told the public, you don't need to worry, the data has been anonymized. Um, it was Latanya Sweeney who realized, who was a computer, uh, uh, computer science graduate at the time, uh, that this wasn't the case. She was able to purchase some voter registration uh, information, uh, join the two tables together, uh, and send um, William Weld his medical records. Uh, so we need to make a way to make it harder for this to happen. Uh, and one way we can do that is to make the data less granular. Um, so we introduce the concept of generalization. Um, and generalization, we're sort of blurring the raw values uh, to remove some precision. So uh, address could just become city. Uh, a date of birth, you could generalize to a year. An age itself could be uh, blurred or bucketed into uh, an age range. Um, and specific categories of things, I've given the example of a dog here, uh, could be moved from uh, the species just to the animal type itself. Um, and we're doing this so that not each uh, individual row um, becomes identifying, and you want a, a few rows that have similar, similar values. Uh, and to formalize this theory a bit more, we have this in, uh, concept of k-anonymization. Um, and so a data set is k-anonymous for every combination, uh, if for every combination of indirectly identifying attributes, so zip, date of birth, and gender, there are at least k records. So with the data set we had before, uh, we've now created, it's now been anonymized to um, a k anonymous level of two. We've got two uh, direct groups. Uh, and if we now bring up the table that the, uh, the adversary had before, they're no, uh, no longer able to link it.
And so as we apply these, um, as, as dimensions grow in data, these concepts of generalization and, and masking uh, start to sort of fail. Um, so to make sort of high dimensional data, for example, uh, k-anonymous, you end up losing a lot of the utility of the data. Um, so now we're going to look at uh, an example of a high dimensional uh, data type, and that would be a location trace. Uh, so what is a location trace? Uh, a location trace is our journey through the world in, in space and time. Um, and, we're, uh, and our location's been recorded on our smartphone uh, something like every 15 seconds or something. I can't remember the exact value. Um, and that's being sent to things like cellular providers, um, Wi-Fi providers, or any applications that we've decided to give our location, um, our location to. Um, and this can also extend past uh, our mobile phones. When we're using loyalty cards or credit cards, our location's been tracked offline. Um, and we're starting to see facial recognition technologies be introduced now, which can uh, track our location around specific events. And so today we've got an example of a tourist who's come to London. They're starting at the British Library, working their way down to Green Park, stopping for a bite to eat in Southbank, going to Sir John uh, Soane's Museum, and then finally to St. Paul's before getting bored of tourism and heading over to Data Science Festival. And so the important thing here is that it's uh, really easy to uh, identify someone based off the location. I think uh, the figure is if you've got 1.5 million location traces, you can identify them uniquely uh, of four data points for 95% of them. Um, so we're going to do a, a demo with you guys, but don't worry, it's not going to require too much of your, uh, your effort. Um, we've got some background information about someone in the room. Um, and basically, I'm going to list off uh, a number of boroughs and times um, and if you were there in that borough at that time, stay standing. If you weren't, uh, sit down. Um, and we're going to find out if that's enough to identify them. OK, so please stand up. <laughs> OK, so first location. They were in central London at 10 AM this morning. This area does count as central London, so good. You're all here on time. Oh, 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 some people. <laughs> all right, OK. The second location point was there in Southwark at 6 p.m. on Friday. So if you weren't in Southwark at 6 p.m. on Friday, please sit down. If you were in Southwark, yeah, remain standing at 6 p.m. on Friday. So that was yesterday. OK, cool. So the next data point is there at Greenwich at 9 p.m. on Wednesday. So if you're in Greenwich at 9 p.m. on Wednesday, please stay standing. Is there anyone else standing, just apart from that? Gentleman Butler. OK, cool. So that took three data points to uniquely identify someone. Don't worry, that's Jack, my colleague. I'm, I'm not being spying on anyone. <laughs> yeah, so that really drives home the point that you don't need many, place, uh, many locations um, to, to directly identify someone. Um, and in fact, generalizing to borough, I had some extra slides in case it got weird. Um, generalizing to borough doesn't do much to help the, the situation. Uh, and here's another example. So this is a, a location linkage attack, similar to what we just did. We have uh, a private location trace here of someone that's been to Hampstead Heath, a lecture, the office, and then to the hospital. And they'd quite like to keep the fact they've been to the hospital private. But at the same time, they've been making posts on social media um, about their trip to Hampstead Heath and, and the lecture they've been to. Um, and we saw them in the office later that day. And so based on this information, information alone, we now know that their, sens their sensitive value, which is that they've been to the hospital. And so. When we're dealing with uh, location traces, one way that we can um, reduce this risk of um, exposing this information is to consider what we're actually publishing or sharing the location trace itself for. You might not need the researcher or the user of the data uh, to have the entire raw location trace. Perhaps they only need to know the distance traveled, the time that was spent traveling, or maybe the numbers of boroughs uh, visited instead. And if these values that you've calculated are then still sensitive, you can use uh, techniques like we mentioned previously, like generalization uh, and masking um, to further process them. Um, so this idea of extracting features um, can be taken further. Perhaps we only publish ag aggregate statistics. Um, so Bob, Alice, and Charlie are back again. Their health records are still there. Um, don't know what happened to Eve. And now, instead of publishing this data set correct, uh, this data set directly. We're going to release statistics based on this data set. So we've got the test results broken down by gender, location, uh, and age. Um, and surprisingly, it's still possible to infer individual sensitive information based on aggregate, aggregate statistics alone. So say we wanted to find out about Alice's uh, sensitive value, the fact that she tested positive. 
And we have a bit of background information um, that Alice was the only female in Birmingham uh, that went for this health test. Uh, most aggregate statistic releases would stop you querying directly for females in Birmingham because um, the sample size is too low. But it's possible to build up this image kind of going the long way around. So we might start first by making a query uh, for the number of people that tested positive uh, in Birmingham. Um, and here there was 32 individuals. We then make a second query for the total count of individuals that tested positive in Birmingham that were also male. And this produces uh, a result of 31. We now have this difference of one. We know that Alice was the only female in Birmingham. And so therefore, this person down here on the right is, uh, is Alice. Uh, this is known as a differencing attack. And if we keep releasing statistics of a data set, it gets to a point where it's actually possible to recreate the data set itself. Um, so there was a case with the US uh, census um, in 2010 where they released data on 300 uh, million people. Uh, and of, that, of, that, of those people, they then released 5 billion statistics. Um, it was possible then to create linear equations from these statistics and solve them together to recreate the entire data set. Um, the way you can think about doing this is kind of creating like a Sudoku problem um, and then reasoning about the constraints of the problem um, and, and being able to recreate the values from that. Uh, this is a tutorial, which is quite funny, uh, by John Abode talking about how that attack was done uh, and what the results were. Uh, so how do we protect against these sort of attacks? I'm going to introduce the concept of uh, differential privacy. And practically what we're doing here is we're distorting the data to protect against these attacks by adding precisely calibrated randomized noise to the statistics. Uh, and in doing so, we're protecting the individual entries without, uh, without massively changing the result. If a person decides to opt out of the data set collection, that should not change the results too much. Um, and differential privacy basically means that the amount that we can infer from groups of people, um, we should be able to infer quite a lot about groups of people, but we shouldn't be able to identify things about individuals. Um, so this idea of um, distortion is directly linked to privacy. So the more distortion you have, the more privacy you have. But too much in the data set becomes useless. Um, and it's this link between distortion and privacy um, that allows us to reason about how much we want to learn about groups of people, um, and how much we want to learn about individuals. Uh, and the par parameter that controls that is referred to as epsilon. Um, and so if you imagine you're considering whether to take part in a medical study or not, um, and there's two sort of data sets, so say you decide to take part of it, you'll become part of the, the data set with you in it, and if you don't, you're not in it. Differential privacy guarantees that the attacker can learn virtually nothing more about you than if you weren't in the data set. Um, the extent of how much the attacker learns um, is controlled by this parameter epsilon. Uh, which sets the bound and change in belief or probability of any outcome. Uh, so a low value of epsilon, such as 0.1, means that someone's belief of you, about you for you being in the data set can't change much. But an uh, epsilon of uh, something larger, like 10, means that their belief, beliefs could change quite substantially. Um, and so with this concept of noise addition, I kind of break that down a little bit more. Normally, when we do that, we're sampling from a Laplace distribution. Um, so here we have. Uh, three locations, um, and the raw count values. Um, and these values on the right are the values after noise has been added. Um, and this, these changes in um, percentage are the differences in prob prob probability of an outcome due to Alice's inclusion in the data set. So you can see with a 23% increase um, in learning about Alice, uh, or, th or the outcome of the problem, uh, we've only had to add a small amount of noise. But you might decide that that, that change in belief is too high. Uh, we're not protecting enough um, about the individuals. And you could go the completely opposite way and make the belief only change 0.2%. But in doing so, you've greatly skewed the values. So for example, Manchester, the results have gone up more than like 10 times. So you think you could argue that that's made the data set not very good. Um, and in the middle, um, you have this kind of sweet spot between privacy and utility, where the percentage uh, change in what you've learned is, is, is smaller, and the noise added hasn't completely distorted the data. So if we go back to the problem that I was talking about, so with that differencing attack when we had all the people on the, on the screen, um, if we think about the second query we, we made, where we queried for the total count of people that were testing positive in Birmingham um, that were male, and we had the value 31. If we now concentrate solely on the total value for Birmingham, if Alice wasn't in the data set, the value would be 31. But if Alice decided to opt into the data set, this value would become 32. Uh, and her contribution would be revealed. So this is before the noise addition. Once we've applied noise with differential privacy, regardless of whether Alice is in the data set or not in the data set, 
the, no, uh, the value will be around 31 or 32. It could be 30 or 33, and then with decreasing probabilities, uh, numbers outside of that range. Uh, but the important thing here is it's impossible to be sure exactly what the value was, um, and therefore your belief of what Alice's true res uh, result was doesn't meaningfully change. By using differential privacy, um, you also get some additional ben benefits. Um, so if you're releasing lots of statistics on a data set, and they each have their own uh, epsilon, um, you can kind of think of epsilon a little bit also as privacy loss. These statistics all add up together to produce a total privacy loss for the whole data set. Uh, you also got strength against arbitrary background information. So before when we talked about low dimensional and high dimensional data, uh, we had this problem where we didn't know what was going to happen in the future. So uh, data might be released or people's inference me and methods might improve. Uh, differential privacy um, takes a different approach and, and it solves the problem that the attacks themselves are using, which is the actual inform information leakage in the first place. And then finally, um, security under post-processing. Post um, that means that once you've calculated a different, differentially private result, uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, uh, it's safe to, safe to use. There are some problems uh, using differential privacy in practice, uh, and the main one is setting uh, an optimum value for epsilon. So like I mentioned, small epsilon uh, provides better protection, at the value, um, better protection at the cost of utility. So it's this uti privacy utility trade-off. Um, and we want to set a value where this risk level becomes uh, suitable. But we also need to justify the reasoning for why we set it to this value. Uh, so imagine you participated in a data set, uh, and it came out that your, uh, the value for epsilon for that data set was 4.5. Uh, would you be terrified? Would you be relieved? Uh, what the regulator is going to think? Uh, likely, no one will really, really know. Um, so basically, we need to be, take a principal approach uh, to choosing epsilon that we can then justify. But this concept of differential privacy doesn't just apply to aggregate statistics. Uh, machine learning models. Um, can also use differential privacy. So although they're not uh, releasing data sets themselves, um, they can leak information about the training, the training set they used for, um, for being trained. So imagine now uh, we've got a model, and we're going to use the model to infer whether someone's in a positive mood or a negative mood. Uh, and we've got our training data set. And this training data set now uh, consists of people that only tested positive uh, for the illnesses that we discussed in the previous slides. Uh, the model's not going to release the data set correctly, uh, directly, but through interacting with the model, it will leak information about these people. So if we consider the uh, two stages of interacting with the model, the first is the uh, training phase. Uh, here we're sending a uh, list of images, in this case, uh, with, the label, with the labels of whether someone's in a positive and negative mood. We're then repeatedly, sending them, uh, re repeatedly running over them with the model um, and calculating what the model believes to be the value. We're then calculating the difference between the label and the model's prediction to calculate error. And through each iteration um, of running the training phase, we're decreasing the error until it gets to a level that we're happy with. Uh, and then we've then got the model's parameters and the weights that we're going to use. In the prediction phase, uh, we're taking one record at a time that the model hasn't seen. Uh, and we're then sending it to the model, asking what the model uh, uh, using what the model's learned in the training phase to then predict a value of whether the person's in a positive or negative mood. Uh, and the output of the model will be uh, a list of probabilities for each category, either positive or negative, uh, and how confident the model believes that person fits each category. And when we're doing this training and prediction phase, we're hoping that the model is learning generalized features about what it means to be positive or negative. But if we have kind of uh, complex models that are able to um, that run the risk of overfitting, um, we could end up in a case where the models only really learn uh, to memorize the training set itself. Uh, and this, in doing so, this is a privacy risk. So we have a concept of uh, membership inference attack. Uh, and here what's happening is an adversary can send records to a model um, and observe the output and use what he's seeing from the output to decide whether the model has seen this image before. So let's imagine he starts by sending a photo of Charlie uh, to the model. The model returns that it thinks that Charlie's in a positive mood, but it's fairly, it's fairly uncertain about that. The adversary could probably assume that the model hadn't seen Charlie before. The adversary then sends a photo of Bob, and the model says with high certainty that he's in a positive mood. Uh, and this confidence is revealing, and it could infer that the, the, the model has seen this image before. 
Uh, and in doing and, and in telling uh, the adversary this, the adversary learns that Bob um, uh, tested positive for the illness in the previous slides. And so differential privacy, when applied to machine learning, allows for provable guarantees of privacy and reduce the, risks, the risk of sensitive information being leaked. Um, it should be impossible to, by looking at a model's parameters to infer if a single record was part of a data set or not. TensorFlow has recently introduced a TF privacy library that allows easy implementation of differential privacy. Um, and it does this, or one of the ways it does this, is by wrapping the optimizers um, in a privacy pres preserving layer. Uh, so an optimizer being like stochastic gradient descent or something like that. One of the potential downsides in doing this is it's changing the underlying training algorithm. But as I'll uh, tell you in a minute, this is actually uh, can lead to uh, benefits. So one of the uh, algorithms that it's using for uh, implementing differential privacy is different differentially private stochastic and gradient descent. Um, and so if we think about uh, the vanilla version of st stochastic gradient descent, what we're doing is it's an iterative process. With each iteration, uh, we're giving we're randomly selecting values from the training set. We're then getting the model to predict whether it thinks those uh, images are in positive and negative mood. Uh, we're getting the real values uh, of that training set. We're calculating the difference between them, which is the error or loss. We then differentiate that loss in relation to the model's weights, uh, and we update these gradients uh, to, to decrease the error. And we keep doing this, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, until error is at a uh, low enough uh, value that you're, you're happy with the model. Differential private scattering gradient then does this, but with a, a privacy guarantee built into it. Uh, and it also introduces two new techniques to, um, to introduce differential privacy. The first is gradient clipping. Um, and gradient clipping basically uh, limits the amount that a, second rec a single record could influence the model. Uh, and it does this by limiting the maximum amount that a gradient uh, can update in each iteration. The second method is random noise sampling. So in here, we're um, sampling random noise and adding that to the gradients for the update. And by doing this, we're making, we're making it so that the model can't work out that the an adversary can't work out whether the behaviors that the model is um, showing are coming from data that it's seen in the training set or just random noise that you've sampled. Uh, and one of the benefits to using this is that you reduce the risk of overfitting. Um, so if we think about uh, the problem itself, uh, so identifying whether someone's in a positive or negative mood, and we break it down into two dimensions, uh, positive being uh, the pink things and uh, negative being the blue. When, we train, when we're training a model, we're getting the model to create um, a boundary between these two parts so it can separate them into the two categories. And if we're doing this by eye, we might draw something a little bit like this. But if we're using a complex model that's prone to overfitting and we leave it to train for a while, we might end up something like this, which I guess looks good uh, on the face of it, but really it hasn't generalized about the problem and instead it's memorized the data set. Um, so when it comes to the prediction phase uh, and you apply some data that it hasn't seen before, uh, it performs uh, less favorably than the smoother slope that we talked about first. And when we use differentially private stochastic gradient descent, we're essentially blurring the model's view of the, of the data points. Uh, and in, so in doing so, we're reducing its ability to overfit to the problem, uh, and that leads to more robust models um, and less information being leaked. So that was a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour through different types of data and the vulnerabilities that are present. Uh, we looked at low-dimensional data um, and how generalization and masking and data minimization can be used to avoid re-identification and linkage attacks. We then looked at location traces and how um, moving from high-dimensional data down to lower dimensions, we can, um, we can then use the methods that we learned in low uh, the low-dimensional data section to improve the problem. We looked at aggregate statistics and how differential privacy can be used to apply noise to statistics to in order to protect people's sensitive information from differencing attacks and reconstruction attacks. And finally, we looked at the machine learning models uh, and how when they overfit, they run the risk of leaking uh, information about the training set uh, and how differential privacy can be applied uh, to reduce this. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, what a uh, um, amazingly clearly uh, communicated uh, set of lessons. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the last five, ten minutes? Yep. Uh, first off, I have to reiterate uh, what you just said. Uh, absolutely fantastic, clear conversation, something that is very complicated because you need to understand both 
concerns around privacy and uh, machine learning for a lot of it. And really, congratulations on that. I'm Thank blown you. away. I'm definitely going to steal that presentation a lot. <laughs> um, one technique that you haven't talked about, I've heard a bit. It sounds science fictionish to me until, until uh, at least this morning, where I saw what you can do with photos. Some people have suggested to create fake records ah, with, yeah. uh, I think, GANs as a uh, source of it. Ah, have yeah. you heard of that technique? Does it make so, sense to you? Or do you feel like it's just the same as creating a publishing machine learning model and you will have a risk of leaking through what the models implicitly imply? So I think, I'm not an expert in that area, but I think what you're referring to is the, kind, the concept of synthetic data that's generated through GANs. Um, so yeah, it's not something I've looked loads into, uh, but I know there is risk with that, because obviously when you're using a GAN, you're kind of getting it to, uh, I believe, work out the probability distribution for different things, and you run the risk of that it could actually learn from the data set itself and start producing uh, records that it was trained on. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I, I guess that's, the, yeah, so that's kind of like our thought on it, we're kind of like just observing it. Um, it one thing that I've heard it being used for, which might be good, is if you just need like quick, quick access to data, uh, in terms of like development, um, and a real data release probably will come at some point, but it's just a quick way of getting something out there first, whilst you work on the more private version. Any further questions? Hi. Uh, the machine learning techniques, the uh, gradient descent and stuff like that, how far do you, can you go with that? Because effectively, you are sub-optimizing the optimization that you want. Right. Yeah. In a way, so then you are basically you got a you got a very sharp sword. Yep. You're blunting it, so it that it's no longer effective if you overdo it. Yeah, it's not something that I've personally played with, um, but from what I've seen, uh, you you can uh, there are two more parameters that you can tune. So the, the parameter is how much you clip the gradients, um, and how much your how much noise you're adding to the, how much you're adding how much noise you're adding to the gradients. Uh, and basically, once you do that, you get a report of how much privacy you've introduced by, by doing so. So I imagine with most things, it's that, that concept of just tuning those until you're getting the, the values that you want. Um, gradient clipping uh, is used as a way to, uh, as far as I'm aware, is actually used already as a way to uh, protect against overfitting. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that works, but I guess people must be seeing use of it outside of privacy as well. Thank you. Any more for anyone? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the interesting and very important talk. Um, so I try to relate to my company. So my company is mainly uh, dealing with email data, customer email data. We have about 35 petabytes of data, but uh, unfortunately we can't really leverage the content of the emails for our, say, machine learning platform or other uh, analytics. We can analyze or aggregate on the metadata of the emails, mm -hmm. but then we can't really look into the content so do you have any suggestions that we can somehow get around it and make our customers confident that we are not actually looking into that data? Yeah, so there's a couple of techniques with that. Um, the, the problem that you described is the, the problem of uh, unstructured data. So data that's not in like, tabular format, I guess. Um, I guess it's, you've, got to, you've got to identify what the risk is in that data set. Uh, so if it's nice things like telephone numbers or credit card information, you can do pattern matching quite easily to, to remove that information. Uh, but if it is just like emails between people, there's such a, a wide array, like a wide array of what could be considered private in those emails that it's hard to sort of solve that problem straight on. So certainly removing direct, identi uh, direct identifiers, for example, um, is fairly trivial. But yeah, um, the problem of raw text is huge, and I, I guess that's an ongoing area of research. Further questions? Yep. Uh, hey, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, you are showing an example with uh, where you calculated aggregate stati statistics based on your data. Uh, my question is, have you came across examples where, uh, based on those aggregates, you create a time series and you like want to predict the future values of the time series, and now, let's say, if you anon anonymize your data, actually you are still interested in what is the order because you want to know if, let's say, your, your aggregate statistics goes up or goes down. Um, have you come across of examples of also having adding this random noise uh, to anonymize the data, but also to be still capture some of the predictive, uh, predictive uh, power? Um, sorry, I, haven't quite, I didn't quite understand. Is it the how do you handle if you're adding noise 
uh, but then you're getting snapshots of data over time, and how do you how do you trace that? So you calculate the aggregates, like I don't know. Uh, let, let's say you're calculating the GDP of a country based on uh, on this census data, mm -hmm. um, and you want to anonymize it. Uh, basically, you'll introduce noise, and yep. you'll not have the exact value yes. anymore. Uh, but you still want to use that data in order to predict the future values in, in the future. Does yep. that make sense? Yeah, yep. So basically, you are still interested in, in a certain way in the order of the data. Yeah, uh, in the order of the data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can still you can basically make snapshot releases. Uh, mm. So you might release that value at one point, and then release the value again at another point. And each additional release, when you do that, you're adding to the information loss. So you are releasing more information over that period of time. So you'll call that that slight issue. Um, but yeah, so the way you'd solve that problem was, would be release to do multiple releases of that value over time. Uh, and then you've got them ordered. And you can, I guess, predict off those. Uh, and the releases are still with the added random noise. You just yes. do multiple releases. Yeah, so and each, each, each value has a different amount of noise added to it. OK, so basically, you'll still be able to infer and make predictions yeah. for the futures, but at the same time, yes. it will be anonymized. And I guess in the case of your issue, you've got to make sure that the noise you're adding is, is not harming utility to the point that you can't forecast off it. So that's something to bear in mind when you tune it. Cool. Thank you. Do we, do we have any further questions? I think we've got time for one, one down more. One down here. One over here. Hi, it, it was amazing. I've got a question that is more on the business side. I was wondering, have you seen any uh, drivers beside uh, compliance and uh, having uh, adhere to the regulation that would drive efforts within businesses? And I'm asking this question because from my experience, th there was always a, a huge pushback within the business uh, against that perceived degradation of quality the moment mm. you wanted to uh, introduce any of those methods. I guess... So, so the way I can think is there must, in, in businesses, there must be data that people aren't, aren't utilizing just due to the, the risk. I guess it would probably be under compliance and regulation, but to use that data would then expose people and would cause reputational harm to a business. So I guess the driving factor for business is the fact they can now utilize that data, um, use it to drive innovation, uh, use it to uh, yeah, improve profits, I guess, that's one thing. So, so yeah, yeah, by being able to unlock that data, um, they can, they can do, use it. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we again thank Tom for that wonderful Thanks. presentation?